Welcome back to our master class, everyone. In part 13 of our series on chronic adult and senior knee joint pain, we will delve deeper into injection strategies for the different pain generators. Previously, we have studied many contributing pathologies to knee pain in adults. As a result, it is important to find various types of pathologies as potential sources of pain during the pain assessment to effectively control the pain generator and deliver the drug to the greatest chance of relieving the pain by selecting the best target places. It is a case of horizontal tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus with a posterior root tear. The posterior aspect of the meniscus is the most common site of pain generator of meniscal pain. It is a case of a massive tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus with a posterior root tear. I introduced one article. In terms of specific locations within the meniscus, the study found that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus was the most commonly affected site, 45.8%, followed by the body of the medial meniscus, 33.8%, the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, 20.1%, the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, 13.9%, and the body of the lateral meniscus, 9.1%. It is a case of mucoid degeneration of the anterior cruciate ligament. It is another case of mucoid degeneration of the anterior cruciate ligament. It is another case of severe mucoid degeneration with an anterior cruciate ligament tear. During the physical examination of the knee, if the patient feels severe pain and limited range of motion during the passive flexion test, you should consider either posterior root tear or anterior cruciate ligament pathology. It is a case of severe mucoid degeneration with a posterior cruciate ligament tear. These patients show diffuse subchondral bone marrow in the medial femoral, medial tibial condyla, and intercondylar tibial subchondral bone. The patient shows diffuse subchondral bone marrow edema in the tibial posterior intercondylar area and severe degenerative tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. The patient shows diffuse inflammation and immersed fluid penetration of the posterior fat fad, which is not in a synovial joint space but extrasynovial space under the deep fascia of the posterior knee. It is a case of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament degenerative tears. In addition, there is a mucoid degeneration of the anterior cruciate ligament and intercondylar ganglion cyst. The patient could not bend the knee properly because of the severe pain. If you find out each pain generator, how could you control the pain generator, and what are the injection strategies? Join our master class membership today and unlock a treasure trove of knowledge. Benefit from twice weekly videos, including inspiring lectures, clinical case discussions, and image interpretation insights. Elevate your skills and connect with like minded doctors. Subscribe now for a brighter professional future. Image guided interventional treatments aim to improve accuracy, safety, and effectiveness, leading to better outcomes and pain relief. Accurate needle placement, reduced risk of complications, real time adjustments, and minimal invasiveness are benefits of imaging guidance during interventional procedures. But the injection protocol has mostly stayed the same since the first injection adopted by James Henry Syriax. An increase in the accuracy of administering the steroid into the joint space can be expected with the ultrasound-guided procedure. Still, intraarticular injection of triamcinolone is the golden standard of steroid injection therapy in knee osteoarthritis. Furthermore, comparing intra-articular infiltrations of a placebo, steroids, hyaluronic, and PRP for knee osteoarthritis does not look smart idea. In addition, disputing the steroid effectiveness in knee osteoarthritis after administering drugs in the intra-articular route only is also a waste of time. Why is that? Even though intra-articular injections are most commonly used to manage symptoms associated with knee joint osteoarthritis, they typically target the joint synovial and hyaline cartilage linings. While they allow not reach the peripheral portion of the meniscus or cruciate ligament, intra-articular injections can rely on the passive diffusion of the drug to the pathologic area. Also, it is worth noting that intra-articular injections may not be able to deliver medication to structures outside of the joint, such as the cruciate ligament, subchondral bone marrow lesion, 
and deep collateral ligament structures. Therefore, a new injection approach to pain generators should be adopted to deliver the medicine to the specific target point effectively. I have developed and stored good results of the new approach and target point in chronic osteoarthritis. The goals of my image-guided injection are to target the pain generator accurately, maximize coverage of all pain generators, select spaces that retain the injectant for a longer time, choose spaces with high concentrations of pain fibers or nerve passages, infiltrate into spaces with minimal resistance, and expecting to facilitate the stabilize the joint by helping fibrosis and thickening of the ligaments. My first injection strategy. As close as possible to the pain generator. How can I apply this strategy to meniscal pathology? Administering injections for meniscus injuries requires a targeted approach. It means the needle should be inserted as close as possible to the pathologic area of the meniscus, whether in the injured or inflamed area. For example, if the injury is a posterior medial root tear, the needle should be placed close to the posterior root. On the other hand, in cases of a squashed inflamed meniscus, the injection should cover the entire affected area. Identifying the lesion's specific type and location of the meniscus pathology is crucial to target the pain generator and to achieve the best possible results. Also, the ultrasound guide's precise pinpoint injection is critical for the best effect. Administering injections for cruciate ligament injuries also requires a targeted approach. First, I advance the needle to the posterior fat pad triangle for the posterior cruciate ligament, which is the closest to the pathologic area. Second, I advance the needle to the anterior fat pad triangle for the anterior cruciate ligament pathology. Furthermore, it would be best to understand that the posterior fat pad triangle is closest to the posterior root the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, posterior attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament. Direct administering injections for subchondral bone marrow lesions is not feasible. So, I use the venous penetrating networks into the bone marrow at the periosteum of the bony cortex nearby pathology. The second, select spaces which have a lot of nociceptors or passage of sensory nerves. To achieve the second golden injection strategy, we have studied the supplying sensory nerve anatomy and nociceptors of the meniscus to find the ideal space. It is an axial scan of the meniscal level. The arrow of the right posterior corner indicates the cross-sectional area of the sartorius muscle. The green arrows indicate the cross-section image of the medial and lateral collateral ligament. The multiple yellow dots indicate the multiple articular branches on the surface of the joint capsule. The previous MRI image showed this level sectional anatomy of the articular sensory branches. The upper medial and inferior genicular nerves are depicted on the femoral and tibial condyle's anterior surface. According to three-dimensional anatomic correlation, these nerves do not cover the yellow dots area. At the same level, the genicular nerves are located on the joint capsule of the anterolateral aspect of the knee joint. According to the anatomic correlation, the three branches will be located at the joint capsule of the anterior knee joint. Also, these nerves could not cover the meniscus's posterior and posterior lateral aspects. If you knew the incidence of posterior meniscal tears among the pain generator of chronic knee osteoarthritis, you could easily estimate the outcome of the sensory thermal radiofrequency neurotomy. So, unfortunately, the chances of successful pain reduction of sensory denervation would be very low. One area for improvement in the anatomic study of the articular branch is understanding we are missing a critical point. The sensory articular nerve studies have been performed on the joint capsule's main and terminal branches. However, the sensory nerve anatomy inside the joint capsule should be further elucidated. It is owing to the technical difficulties of the tracing nerve and surgical needs. So, I had to collect the predetermined data of the sensory neural anatomy and reform it to connect the missing point according to my observation and clinical research. Then, I proposed a new neural network model for the meniscal sensory nerve supply. I had to find a sensory innervation of the posterior joint capsule because it is a more important nerve supply for the high incidence of meniscal tear and cruciate pathology.
Dr. Peng's research gave me great insight into drawing the sensory nerve supply of the posterior knee joint. They verified the detailed anatomy of posterior sensory articular branches of the posterior knee. Posterior capsules are supplied by common perineal, tibial, and obturator nerves. The articular sensory nerves from the tibial nerves are the superior and inferior branches, and branches from the common perineal nerves are the anterior and posterior branches. The obturator contributes to the posterior joint capsule by posterior division. I noticed that all the sensory branches converge into the central aspect of the popliteal fossa. I also adopted vascular microscopic anatomy studies of the meniscus and cruciate ligaments because the nerve accompanies the vessel. Under these background studies, I could figure out the detailed anatomy of the sensory nerve supplies of the deep structures. I will show you a three-dimensional orientation of the sensory nerve supply in axial and coronal sectional images. The medial meniscus receives a sensory nerve supply from the perimeniscal neural network. These perimeniscal neural networks give radiating sensory branches into the red zone of the meniscus. The articular sensory nerves contribute to the perimeniscal neural networks. Each nerve forms a plexus and overlaps in the perimeniscal neural network. The superior and inferior genicular nerve, a sensory branch of the saphenous nerve, contribute to the anteromedial meniscus. The obturator and tibial nerve contribute to the posterior horn, the posterior part of the mid-horn, and the posterior root of the medial meniscus. The posterior cruciate ligament receives a sensory nerve supply from the posterior branches, presumably from the tibial and common perineal nerves. But, the anterior cruciate ligament does not have a dedicated sensory nerve supply. While some sensory fibers from the surrounding joint capsule and other ligaments may innervate the ACL to some extent, the ligament has no direct blood supply or nerve innervation. How could the superior and inferior articular branches converge to perimeniscal neural networks in the coronal section? The upper articular branches run downward to the peripheral medial meniscus passing the interfascial of layer 1 and 2, then layer 2 and 3. The lower articular branches converge upward to the perimeniscal area of the medial meniscus, penetrating the interfascial layers. So, in the medial knee, the interfascial administering the drugs between the crural fascia and superficial MCR or between superficial MCR and deep MCR could effectively block the sensory nerve and closest area to penetrate the drugs into the medial horn of the medial meniscus. If you want more information on the detailed anatomy of the multiple layers of the medial knee, please review the previous lectures. I published superficial, intermediate, and deep layers and interfascial layers. The interfascial layers are perfect spaces for a large volume of fluid because they consist of loose connective and areolar tissues. The same principle could be applied to the lateral knee. Like an interfascial layer between the first and second layers of the medial knee, the undersurface of the collateral ligament and iliotibial tract consists of loose connective tissue with areolar tissue and less resistance to injection so it is an ideal space for the injection for blocking the sensory nerve and penetration of drug to the anterolateral aspect of the lateral meniscus. I also published detailed anatomy in the previous lectures, so please watch carefully once more. It is the interfascial layer under the iliotibial tract. The arrows indicate the loose connective tissue with the areolar layer under the lateral collateral ligament. Now, let's focus on the posterior knee. The posterior horn and posterior root receive sensory supply from the posterior articular branches. It is an axial scan of the meniscal level. The multiple yellow dots are supposed to be the terminal branches of the tibial and common perineal nerve. The yellow line is the area that is covered by the posterior innervation. But the posterior horn and root of the medial meniscus are not supplied by the superior and inferior genicular nerve, but by the tibial nerve posteriorly. Therefore, I can only successfully block the sensory signal by posterior fat pad triangular or posterior capsule injection. The same to the posterior part of the lateral meniscus. The posterior part of the lateral meniscus is not supplied by the superior and inferior genicular nerve, but posteriorly by the common perineal nerve. Therefore, 
I can only successfully block the sensory signal by posterior fat pad triangular or posterior capsule injection. Suppose I administer enough local anesthetics into the posterior fat pad triangle. In that case, I can block all the sensory branches of the posterior part of the medial and lateral meniscus. It is an illustration of the deep layer of the posterior fossa. The posterior capsule and some ligamentous structures consist of the deep layer. The line represents the composite structure of the intermediate and deeper layer. The posterior cruciate ligament and pericruciate fat complex are placed under the deep layer. The yellow line bound the border of the posterior cruciate ligament and fatty tissue. There was no specific name under the fatty tissue. So, I called it a posterior fat pad triangle. It occupies and fills the space between the ligament and the deeper layer. It looks tight in the sectional image. But there is enough space to administer the drug in the space. It is my common site of posterior knee injection for the pain relief of the posterior cruciate ligament and the posterior root of the medial and lateral meniscus. Let me explain in more detail. The yellow line is the deep layer. The white arrow indicates the posterior cruciate ligament. It is a sagittal proton image of the posterior fossa showing the deeper layer and posterior fat pad triangle. The yellow line is the deeper layer, and the green triangle is the posterior fat pad triangle. I place the needle in the posterior fat pad triangle for the administering drug in the posterior horn and root of the medial meniscus, posterior cruciate ligament, anterior cruciate ligament, and lateral posterior meniscus pain generators. Next. I discussed the anterior knee. Where is the best area to block the pain signal of the anterior cruciate ligament? Again, you might suspect multiple articular sensory anesthetizations cannot block the pain signal. It is the mid-sagittal view of the infrapatellar fat pad. The infrapatellar fat pad attaches to the patella's inferior corner, the femoral condyle's anterior surface, the superior aspect of the tibia, and the posterior surface of the infrapatellar ligament. The posterior corner of Horfer's fat pad is closest to the anterior cruciate ligament. It is the best way to block the pain signal of the anterior cruciate ligament because most of the sensory nerves must pass the narrowed tunnel. The ACL problem is more common than you would imagine in chronic osteoarthritis. So, in that case, I simultaneously select the posterior corner of Horfer's fat pad and the posterior fat pad triangle. The next goal and injection targets are selecting spaces that hold the injectant longer and are free or less resistant to the injection. All the spaces that I mentioned before meet my ideal target criteria. Next, I will discuss the injection strategy for the bone marrow lesion in chronic osteoarthritis. You might have questions about the following. Safety concerns regarding steroid injections in fatty tissue. Injection protocols and intervals. The process of selecting the target. Different injection protocols. I will address these issues in the next video. Thank you for your continued interest and participation. This overview of the procedure has been informative and enjoyable for you. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude for your attention and see you in the next videos.